Okay. <laughs> Sorry for the disjointed start. Um, one of the things I do for every lecture, including this one, is I record them. So by some by uh, chance that you miss it or whatever, it, it'll be under, I'll show you in a minute here, on, on Canvas modules. And this will be admin. <clears throat> I'm talking about two things. Uh, first thing I want to talk about is the lab deal. Now, because this is a double section, we have a Friday lab and a Saturday lab, and we have lecture. The lecture is on both days, 12 to 1.30ish, okay? The lab is either Friday or Saturday, depends on what section you were originally signed up for. Now, if something should come up and you can't make your assigned lab, just go to the other one. Even if it's for the rest of the semester, that's fine, because we'll have we'll have room. Normally, this class has all the all the sciences in this department, including I also teach at Sac City. Doesn't matter. And I've also taught in Washington State for 17 years and blah, 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 blah. Bottom line is there's a fairly high dropout rate in this class for lots of reasons. People get sick, they end up in the emergency room, whatever, or 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 they have relationship issues and they can't study or whatever, and they have to drop the class. Lots and lots of reasons. But for whatever reason, we usually have about 10 to 12 people drop. So I always overload my class knowing that. That's why there's no problem getting into my class. Now, not all professors have the same um, philosophy. I like to accommodate as many students as possible because it's a pain getting classes. They fill up like that. And what are you supposed to do? Um, in fact, the state wants us to push students through even faster. That means eliminating classes like Chem A. Chem 3A and 3B. Those classes are on the chopping block every year because it retains students longer where they should be moving along. My take on that is BS. If I have a student go into 1A that's not prepared, what happens? They drop out or they flunk. Okay, so your self-esteem is in the toilet and they got to repeat the class anyway. So they're longer anyway. So why not prep them so they're in good shape when they go into 1A, 3A, or 2A. And I've discussed this with legislatures, and they give me this stuff about research shows. And I'm saying, I've taught since 1974. I'm an old guy. I've been in the classroom. I understand when students' self-esteem is in the toilet, everything in their life goes along with it. It's real important to maintain your you know, kind of lifestyle in terms of uh, success in your life. One of them is adequate preparation. That's why this they call this class Chem Preparatory. Now, I've taught 1A at this school, and I've taught 2A equivalent at Sac City, and I've taught both those classes up in Washington, a whole bunch. Um, so I know the problems you're gonna have going into 1A. And that's what I'm gonna focus on in this course. One of them is problem solving. Everyone hates word problems. I'm gonna give you a whole bunch of strategies to work through that. Another is naming. Another is chemical reactions involving calculations. Those are the three big areas. And we're gonna cover other stuff as well, but those are gonna be a big focus. And you will thank me when you get into 1A, 2A, or 3A. Okay. Um, okay. So um, the first two labs are going to be something called a dry lab. We have dry labs and wet labs. Dry labs are basically uh, worksheets. You're going to have two of them. Lab one and lab two are dry labs. So because no chemicals are out, no glassware is out, you don't have to have goggles and a lab coat. So I'm giving you two weeks to get goggles and a lab coat, plenty of time. When we're in lab today, if there is a lab coat hanging on the hanger and it fits you, you're more than welcome to take it. Same with goggles. So anyone who's got you know, cost issues, by all means, I'd recommend taking it home and washing it though. Um, and there are female lab coats and male lab coats. What's the difference? 
Oh, <laughs> the fit, yes. What else? It's the way they button. They don't button the same. So if you have a, a female lab coat that fits you perfectly, but the buttoning is weird, just realize that's why it's weird. Funny story how that originated. Does anyone know one that there's a difference between a, a female blouse and a male shirt? Okay, they button, like they overlap differently. And that's because way back in the royalty times, women never dressed themselves. They always had someone else dress them, which meant it's like a mirror image. So it was like doing it the regular way. And that's how they ended up retaining that button button pattern. So anyway, okay. So anyway, you need a lab coat required. You're gonna need goggles and they have to be chemical plas splash proof. And um, I can show you what they look like. Um, and I also have loaners available if you, um, having a uh, money issue and you just can't get any, yeah. Yes, the worst place to buy anything is a student store. <laughs> and who has the least amount of money in the country? Students, right? Yeah. Um, that's why, um, yeah, they, they have a good supply of stuff there though, but it's just expensive. Yeah, so you can go to Home Depot and get your chemical splash with goggles. They've got to be a brand called Uvex, U-V-E-X. And the model is Stealth. That's the cheapest of the line. They're also the most comfortable. That's what I've been wearing for the last 19 years. Not the same pair, but you know. um, they're very comfortable to wear. The cheap ones, <laughs> excuse me, at Home Depot are like $4, but they leave nerd marks on your face when you take them off, because they have to be tight to get a good fit. And at Sac City, we did some tests and they don't work as well as the UVEX ones. And you can probably get a free pair also. Remember I sent that note out saying, come here on Monday. Did anyone get a free one? Hey, someone did anyway. Okay. Um, okay, so that's the deal with, with labs. Um, and again, if you miss a lab, um, if you miss a Friday lab, you can always go to the Saturday lab. If you miss a Saturday lab, it's a problem because there's no lab. And you can't make up a wet lab. You can make up a dry lab, but not a wet lab. Wet labs require chemicals out. And what you have, um, the woman that was out here talking to you with the curly hair, she's called an instructional assistant for biology. And we have them for chemistry as well. And they have a whole bunch of classes to prep for. And they lay out everything. So they can't go backwards to make up a wet lab. So if you miss a wet lab um, for legitimate reason, not because you slept in, although it... lately I've been sleeping in. <laughs> if you sleep in past noon, that's a problem. But anyway, um, if it's a legitimate reason, um, uh, we can. you won't get full credit, but you can get some credit, which is better than big goose egg. Okay. So that's about lab. I want to get that out of the way because um, it takes time to, to find the lab coat and goggles and all that stuff. Also, closed-toed shoot is a requirement. No exceptions. Okay? That's for wet labs only. Dry labs, you can wear whatever you want. The worst thing to wear in lab are flip-flops. Okay? So basically, this is the test. You take boiling water and pour it on your shoe. If it hurts... It isn't good. It isn't a good lab shoe. If it's okay, then it's a good lab shoe. So things that have holes in the tops of them, even though they're closed, won't work. So just think about the boiling water test, because you are going to be boiling water in this class, and it's been occasionally it spills. Okay. All right. So that's it on lab. Um, there's a very um, detailed lab write-up procedure I'm going to go over next week we get closer to the wet lab. And I have videos on everything, on everything. If you go to, um, I'll bring up Canvas in a minute. If you look at Canvas, go to modules, I have admin, lab related, and units one, two, three, four, five. And those modules are uh, mostly videos. So for example, if we're, if we're looking at a process called stoichiometry, which is unit four, and you missed a lecture, or you wanted an additional lecture, you can go to last 
semesters, unit four stoichiometry, or the semester before that. All those are there. So you have lots of videos to watch besides me. Um, my videos are um, just like I talk now. So, which means they can be boring if you uh, have to listen to, them, if you just want one little piece, but you can also do fast forward. I had a student 17 years ago up in Washington. Uh, there's a lot of Russian students up there in Tacoma area and uh, her English was not her primary language. And she had a lot of trouble. And so she loved the videos. So she writes me this email and she, and she watched the video for balancing a chemical equation 17 times. She said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I went, wow, this is a really valuable asset. So I've been doing videos ever since. So I have lots of them. They're all, I have a YouTube channel where I store everything. Because I made a mistake a long time ago of not storing them on YouTube. And then Tacoma Community College decided to change some parameters and I lost all my old videos. So my videos only go back about four years, but there's still a lot, but I, have, I think I have 300 or so videos stored there. Um, so now I have control of them, not the school. Um, all right. Um, now, normally um, there's no worksheets or homework uh, in this class. Your grade is dependent on labs and tests. And you're going to have five tests. Um, what I have here, and you can ask questions anytime you want. Hey, don't be shy now. Um, um, so this week, uh, we're going to be doing um, Dry Lab 1. And Dry Lab 1 is on significant figures. And if you've never been in a chemistry class before, you will learn about that today. Um, next week is kind of weird because we have um, Labor Day. So um, Saturday, there's no lecture or lab. And then Friday, the lab is going to be to be determined. And what I'll do with there is just a work session. It's totally optional. You don't have to go. You don't want to. Um, I have the same problem at Sac City, juggling. It's even harder at Sac City. They teach on Monday, Wednesday there. So the Monday, I have a lab on Monday and a lecture on Monday, and it, it's screwed up. So I just have to juggle. Um, but what I have here is the, um, it'll, it'll say dry lab. Um, 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 you're not going to check in locker-wise until... Um, September 6th and 7th. And what it is, I have a cart with cubbies in it. And each cubby's got a series of glassware. So that's when I say check in, you're gonna make sure all the glassware is there, it's clean, uh, et cetera. And then you're gonna sign a, a lab um, safety report. And also you need to do a, um, a waiver. Now, those are going to be the easiest points ever in this class. There are two kinds of points in this class, hard points and easy points. Labs are easy points. Test points are hard points. So you want to maximize the easy points to go against your hard points. Okay? Um, I do round. A lot of people say, do you round? Yeah. So if you're 89.5, that's the same as 90, because I round to 90. 90 is the lowest A grade. So your goal in this class should be, if I was in my class, I would say I need to get an 89.5 extra credit. I do offer extra credit. Um, the extra credit is I don't drop any, I don't drop the lowest test score. And the reason why I don't do that is I used to do that for a long time. And I found that really good students that get A's on tests one through four blow off test five. You get a zero on it. And you know what? It still averages out to an A. So they didn't study unit five at all. And it really bugged me. <laughs> so I stopped doing that. And what I do instead is, um, who knows what a rebate is? Does anyone know what a rebate is? Yeah. What's a rebate? Yeah, 
you kind of get money back, get money back in your Yeah, yeah. We're going to do it with test points. Um, you can do an extra credit assignment and it'll go against your lowest test score. You get a 50% rebate on how much you've missed. So if you get a 60% on your test, how much have you missed percentage wise? 100 minus 60, <laughs> 40, right? And what's half of 40? 20%. So that means you go from a 60 to an 80 on that test. Go from a D to a B. You can do it once. Totally optional. What I recommend is you do it during break. After eight weeks, you're going to have a, a, a one-week break. No class, no lecture. I'd recommend if you're going to do it, that's a good week to do it. It's due between now and the end of the semester in December. And it's on any topic you like. It'll be a poster. If you go on Canvas, I'll show you next, I'll show you in a minute. Are there any questions about the lab schedule before I take that down? Yeah. No. No, you signed up for one or the other. Yeah, it depends on what what did, what did you sign up for, Friday or Saturday? <laughs> okay, if you look at the number of the class, it's either 60, the last two letters or numbers are 66 or 67. 67 is Friday, 67 is Saturday. And you have lecture both days, so lab one or the other. For what? No, no, it, it, wet or dry is going to be your day. And the dry labs are real flexible on because it's a worksheet, basically. The wet lab is the issue, um, particularly in the beginning, because if the lab is full, I can't allow anyone else to come into the lab by state law. I can't have more than 24 in the lab. Dry labs, we can have 60 in the lab because it's not, there's no chemicals out. Oh, and one other thing, everyone, remember, I'm old. When you're old, you can't hear very well. So a lot of you are very soft-spoken, so speak up. You had a question, right? Yeah. No, the lab is optional. Yeah, Friday is the optional one. Yeah, so I'm going to be around. So we can do a worksheet uh, or, or if you have some issues or whatever you work out. Otherwise, Friday lab. lecture. There will be a Friday lecture, though. This is the lab schedule. Only. Lecture is going to be Friday, Saturday, Friday, Saturday, except when we have a holiday. Well, I mean, I don't take attendance. So if you never come, and take the tests and get A's, more power to you. <laughs> but remember, this is a prep class, though. It's designed to prepare you for 1A, 2A, or 3A. So if you don't come, you, you kind of waste your time. One other thing I want to talk about. Um, this is day one stuff, cheating. Because this is a preparatory class, if you cheat in here, it's what you're wasting your time. What's the point? It's just a total way. And some people... <laughs> They cheat. Every semester, someone cheats. And I'm just thinking, why are you in here? <laughs> You're just totally wasting your time. Yeah. Right. And the dry labs. Um, is anyone, um, what I do for, for the lab packet you've got to purchase at the bookstore? Um, sometimes they run out. So what I do is I provide for labs one and two, I provide a digital copy. So if you don't have your packet yet, uh, go on Canvas, go to files, lab related. And I'll show you that in a minute. And you'll see lab one, lab two. Okay, let's get over to Canvas now. Has anyone not used Canvas? Ah, perfect. Okay. 
Oh, and by the way, you don't have to have a white lab coat. That's my lab coat, so. Okay, so if you go to files, lab related, you'll see lab one, lab two, even lab three, depending on, um, like the lab packet at Sac City, the, the vendor that copies our lab packets went out of business. So my suits are all complaining. We can't find a lab packet. I was going, what the heck? And I found out. The, so now I have to submit to a new vendor. I have to find a new vendor. So meanwhile, I'm passing out digital copies of the lab packet. It's crazy. So sometimes we have a problem with the bookstore here, and they do run out of CAMA lab packets. So uh, is anyone not uh, have a lab packet that they tried to buy at the student store and they're out? Do they have them there? Okay, that's good news. Okay, Because it's a pain in the you know what, if it's not there. Okay, so um, if you haven't got your lab packet yet and you have lab today, you're just gonna go log on to Canvas And here's lab one. Now, a lot of people accuse me of having a math class, not a chemistry class for unit one. And you're absolutely right. I, it's just uh, physical sciences like chemistry, physics, molecular biology, biochemistry, have a fair amount of math in. And as you, if you're a chemistry major or an engineer, as you progress through the years at school, the, the math gets increasingly more complex. So if you're a STEM major, chemistry, biology, physics, engineering, or math, you're gonna find you have to take calculus. And you're like, why in the world do you have to take calculus? It's something called physical chemistry. And typically a junior class. And that class is one heck of a math class. <laughs> it is really quite challenging. That was the first C I ever got in a test was in quantum mechanics. I went to Davis. And uh, then I learned how to be a student. <laughs> I learned how to study better, a whole bunch of stuff. But anyway, so that's why you see a lot of math. So our first two dry labs are mathy. Unit one is mathy. Just warning you. Unit two is more, more chemistry, but okay. So anyway, you can um, access dry lab number one through Canvas. I'm saying. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, Okay, this is the syllabus. Um, the syllabus can be very, very long and really boring. So what I do, students want to know two things. They want to know how to get a hold of me and how I grade. So that's what I want to talk about now. Okay, this is the contact information. Um, you can text me, not a problem. Sometimes I get back with you immediately. Other times, depending on what I'm doing or whatever, or I'm sleeping. <laughs> um, uh, I stay up very late also. Um, my late wife, um, it was funny, our first date um, lasted till seven o'clock in the morning. And I found out that she is a night owl. And uh, so I learned to be a night owl too. <laughs> so ever since then, uh, I, I stay up very late. Uh, usually um, one o'clock, usually, sometimes four o'clock, <laughs> just depends. Also, what's on YouTube. Okay, so that's how to get a hold of me. That's my um, email address, um, texting, um, and uh, lecture lab. And the room number is wrong. It should be 111, not 101. So. Okay, so that's the first thing. How do you get a hold of me? Second thing is, how do I grade? You can have five tests, 
100 points a shot. And I convert all raw points to percentages. So everything is worth 100 percent. 100 percentage points. Okay, you're gonna have approximately 12 labs, dry and wet, and they're worth 10 points a piece. My net being 11 or 13, uh, depends on the semester. Um, and then you're gonna have two safety items, which are the same as the lab write-up. That means they're easy points. And the lab safety contract, which you're gonna sign and agree to the terms of that, and also a waiver. It's called a risk waiver. And we do that in the state of California. Every community college, university is publicly funded has to sign this waiver. And it's just a matter of, you're not gonna sue the school if something happens. That's the main thing. People can sue anyway, but if you sign the waiver, Okay, um, so that's basically it. Um, homework is gonna be your dry labs. And secondly, are there any questions about the syllabus? Um, okay. Okay, so this is modules in Canvas, uh, administrative, unit zero, lab related. Here's the lab safety contract. Um, down at the bottom is the, um, high risk waiver. Now, to submit these, you're gonna go to assignments. and you're gonna click on the assignment. Most of the stuff I do in here, you're gonna be scanning it, clicking on the assignment, it's gonna prompt you for a file, and that file is a PDF file that you create. So for your dry lab, you're gonna scan like five pages or whatever, however long it is, save it as a PDF file, and click on the assignment, and it'll ask you to upload a file, and that's the file to upload. One PDF, not a PDF per page, okay? One PDF file. A lot of times at both schools, people will submit a JPEG per page, even though I told them a PDF, and I give them a zero. And I give them a zero to alert them because when you get a zero and they know they turned in the assignment, they'll go, what the heck? And I'll give them a comment that you need to have one PDF file. So, all right. So you should have a scanner app. Uh, there's a ton of them that are free. And on your scanner app, make sure you can add additional pages. You can also buy one, which I wouldn't recommend because the free ones work just fine. Um, now, if you do it in pencil, um, look at the PDF before you upload it because sometimes scanners don't scan pencil very well. I keep saying this every year, I talked to students on day one about this. I need to look up why scanners don't like pencil. But just look at it and make sure you can read it. Remember, I'm old. I have old eyes. <laughs> okay. Um, and I want to do one more thing here. If you go to test related, under files, you'll see extra credit posters. So if you were thinking about doing an extra credit poster, these are some examples. You just click on it and it'll bring it up. I've got, I think, 20 or 30 of them. Also, in Chem 2B, if you take that class, you're going to have to make a poster as well. In Chem 2B, you're required to do it on drugs. Uh, in my class, you can do it on anything chemistry related. I've been doing this a long time, and I have lots and lots of different perspectives on this. One person was into violins. She said, can I do one on violins? I said, sure. I play the violin too. So um, I said, do it on the varnish they use, 
and how different varnishes will make a different sound. That's one of the reasons Stradivarius violins are so expensive. They had a very secret varnish they used that affected the maple wood in a certain way that made the sound better. Uh, another guy was into guitars. He did it on corrosion of the strings. These are all valid topics. Another person did uh, biochemistry of death. What happens to your body when you die? Why do you get sick? Why does rigor mortis set in and then it goes away? A lot of uh, people do it on drugs, uh, caffeine, a um, whole host, a lot of different things. Who's heard of Manuka honey? Anyone? Ah, okay. Is Manuka honey good for you? Yes. Why? It's got all kinds of cool stuff in it. It's got antibiotics in it. It's got um, hydrogen peroxide in it, all kinds of stuff. That's why it works well on wounds. It also tastes like honey, because I always have Manuka around. I can even show you uh, one of my, and the reason I found out about Manuka honey is because two of my students did their posters on Manuka honey. And hospitals have gauze that have Manuka built into the gauze for, for burns and road rash for motorcycle accidents. Um, but I learned that from my students. I didn't know about it until they did a, a poster on it. So it's really cool, some of the topics they come up with. Yes, Manuka honey is really cool honey. It tastes just like honey, only it's expensive. They get it out of the tea plant in New Zealand, and it's highly regulated out of New Zealand. They're very interested in quality that leaves their country. But it works really well. Okay, uh, so anyway, these are some examples. This one is on um, what? Um, yeah, it's on Botox. How does it work? So uh, think about, th there's a textbook I used to use that's called Chemistry is in Everything. And it's true. A lot of things are, lots and lots of things are chemistry-based. You know, it can go into the, um, um, one, one person did it on the, um, the biochemicals of love. Talk about all the hormones involved in uh, when your body goes through changes and stuff. It was very interesting, <laughs> to say the least. All right, so are there any questions about, um, and there's a three panel poster. Um, get black if you can. Black is better in the background than white. Um, it's not required, but it, it just looks better. But I have lots of these examples. You know, smell of the, why does the ocean smell the way it does? You can see big time variety. So if you're interested in doing that again, it's due at the end of the semester or any time sooner. Now, I had one student, after I showed him this, she went home and did her poster that night. Now, at the end of the semester, without the poster, she had 104%. And I said, why did you do the poster? She said, well, I wanted to make sure I had, <laughs> I'm covered. Grade was really important to her. So she didn't, and remember, if you if your lowest grade is a 90, that means you missed 10%, half of 10% is 5%. So you lower the grade, the more you'll get back. Now, one thing about Canvas, you can put in trial scores and they'll show you what your end result will be. So you can, for example, if you've done three tests and you wanna know how you're doing, just put in a trial grade for test four and a trial grade for test five and it'll show you, it'll do all the math for you. So it's a pretty nice, pretty nice feature. Okay. Let's see. Uh, just zoom. Oh, one other thing. Um,
Now, at the end of the lecture today, um, I'm going to close the Zoom session. The Zoom session has no recipients in it, except for me. And because I recorded it, it'll then create an MP4 file, video file. So it has to render that. And then what I do is I transfer that over to YouTube, get a shareable link, and then I go to Canvas, create a page with that shareable link in it, and create a module per lecture. I've been doing this for a long time, so I can do this in my sleep, but a lot of steps though. So, um, and this is where they end up in Canvas modules. So whenever you do a video, there will be a link once it once the page is pulled up. Click on that, and now it goes to YouTube. And who is that, I wonder? <laughs> the reason why you don't hear any, any um, <laughs> the reason why you don't hear any um, audio, because I haven't hooked up Okay, um, so that's how you get to the video of today and tomorrow and so on. Also, if you notice, there's a whole bunch of videos here and I always put on the lecture videos, a date, so you know which day that lecture is for. Okay, so are there any questions about admin? Okay, so let's actually talk chemistry now. Now, your lab today has got, yeah. The textbook is really good. The textbook is just like I teach. Frequently, it's hard to find a textbook in my lecture style that fish. Um, but it's, and buy a used one. Um, don't buy the digital one from the student store they'll charge you more because they're going to charge you with mastering chemistry that I don't use. Buy it directly from Pearson or find a used one. And you can go back two or three versions because chemistry doesn't change. Pictures change, but that's it. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about significant figures. Now, who has heard of significant figures? Has anyone? Okay, about, let's say 20%. Okay. Significant figures, if you measure something, and in sciences, we measure a lot. Biology, chemistry, physics, engineering, you're always measuring something. And there's an inherent error in that measurement instrument you're using. Let's give you an example. When we go in lab today, there's balances, that measure, that weigh things to three decimal places on a gram. Now, a gram's pretty small, and this goes three decimal places, all the way out to the thousandths place. I have a digital, I cook a lot. I have a digital scale at home as well. Mine doesn't have any decimal places on it. It's like two grams or three grams or whatever, or ounces or whatever. Which is more precise, the one in the lab or the one I have at home? Lab. Okay, they both have errors built into it, but one is more precise than the other. And that's what significant fissure, 
significant figures is a measure of. It's the precision of that measuring device. Now, sometimes we're not measuring anything. So the first thing you need to do is to be able to identify the significant figures of, and let me erase some of this stuff here. All right, so let's go through here. And uh, see if we can come up with some rules for significant figures. Okay, the number one, two, three. How many significant figures do you think that has? There's five. Oh, three, okay. <laughs> Anything else? All right, three. What about 1.01? .01? I see three. What about 1.00? Zero, zero? Okay, one, one, three. One point zero zero point three four three. How about one point two times ten squared? That's a scientific notation number. I want to talk about that uh, later today. How many sig figs do you think for that? It's two, 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 two. How about 0 0.0031? We have four, two, two, five. How about 0 0.00530? Two, three, two, four. How about three one zero 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 two six five? Okay. So obviously we can't have three different answers. One's correct, the other two are not. So okay, one two three. Three sig figs. Now, if it's got no zeros or decimal points, you just count the numbers, and that's the sig figs. Um, 1.01. Three is correct. It's got a decimal point, it's got a zero. Now, the issue comes in with zeros and decimal points. If it's got zeros and decimal points, you need to have a red flag that goes up and say, look at this more closely. Okay, 1.00. Now, how is 1.00 and 1.00 period, how do they differ? Are they the same? How do they differ? As what? Okay. And the 100 doesn't? Trailing zeros are important, yeah. They're the same what? Okay, they're not the same from a precision perspective. Now, oops. Those are the correct answers. So they both have trailing zeros, but one has a decimal point, one does not. That's the big deal. 
Remember I said zeros and decimal points. Okay, this has both. So trailing zeros, I'm going to give you some rules in a minute here. Basically trailing zeros count if there's a decimal point. They don't count if there's no decimal point. That's why the trailing zeros up here don't count. Just the one. Trailing zeros plus a decimal point, that means the zeros count. So that's got three decimal points. Now, in your dry lab, um, if you have one zero zero, they're gonna say undetermined. That's a math department's answer. The problem with saying it's undetermined is you can't do anything with it because we're gonna do math with numbers. And those number, numbers are gonna be uh, predicated on the significant figures of what you're working with, the answer I'm talking about. So if it's undetermined, you can't do anything with that. So on your dry lab, they're gonna give you an example and you're not gonna put any undetermined in anything. It doesn't matter what chemistry class you take, what physics class you take, and advanced biology, which you're not gonna have on this campus, um, they're gonna talk about significant figures. Engineering, same thing. Okay, and again, I'm gonna give you some hard, fast rules in a second here. Okay, a, a number with scientific notation in it, only that matters. So 1.2, two sig figs. Everyone got that one right. Okay, now this guy, we have beginning zeros. So if you have beginning zeros and a decimal point, they don't count. So it's two sig figs. Okay, trailing zeros and a decimal point, they count. If they're in the beginning, they don't count, regardless of how many zeros, regardless of how many, uh, if you have a decimal point there or not, doesn't matter. Okay, now on this one here, we have trailing zeros and zeros in the beginning. So the zeros in the beginning don't count, but there is a decimal point. So the trailing zero counts because there is a decimal point. So that means it's three. And this guy here, Three, one, zero, 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 zero. Okay, trailing zeros, no decimal point. So it's got two sig figs. Now, between now and the end of the semester, you're going to be, if you're doing math, you're going to be doing sig figs. Now, there's another class of significant figures that I haven't talked about. Going back to significant figures, if you're using an instrument to measure with, then you have to consider significant figures. How many times I do that? Let me do it again. Some people, I woke up. Was it four, two, three? 3.1, 2.9, 2.8, 2.9999. No, it was exactly three. So what's the sig figs in that? One or one zero or infinite because it's exact and it's not measured. Exactly three. Anything that's exact has infinite precision. Okay, how many eggs are in a dozen? 12. How many sig figs is that? Two. It's a setup. Sorry. <laughs> it's infinite because it's by definition. It's not 11.9. Not 12.1, it's exactly 12. So anything by definition is infinite. And this is going to come into play when we do operations. Or anything that's counted is also infinite. Yeah.
the zeros in the beginning never count. Um, which one you're talking about? Up at the top, 100 dot. Okay, is it a trailing zero or a beginning zero? Correct, it's in the beginning. Zeros in the beginning never count. Zeros in the end only count if there's a decimal point. Doesn't matter where the decimal point is, there's a decimal point in the number of counts. And then zeros in the middle always count, like 101. They're a uh, placeholder. Okay, now um, on your dry labs, you have two dry labs dry lab one, dry lab two. Dry lab two, the first page of your lab packet is lousy. So I redid it. So what I want you to do is uh, between now and next week is to download dry lab two and print page one only. And it's a much better conversion than lab packet, or at least my humble opinion. That's why we did it. And most students like it much better. Yeah. Oh, it was no point there. That's, I don't know what, oh, actually. <laughs> All right, so this, um, okay. If that was the number, it'd be two. Now let's look at this one here. How many sig figs would that be? Okay, we've got beginning zeros, trailing zeros. Beginning zeros, don't worry about. They never count. So we have trailing zeros, number one, and there are what, four of them? And is there a decimal point? Yes, so they count. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's supposed to be a decimal point. <laughs> All right, so let me summarize all this with three rules. And these are zero. So zero is the beginning, never count, no exceptions. That's nice to say no exceptions. Instead of, well, maybe it counts, maybe, you know, never. Ones in the middle always count, no exceptions. And if they're at the end or trailing zeros, they count if there's a decimal present, they don't count if there's no decimal present. All right. Now, when we're doing math operations, there are two situations. We're adding or subtraction, and subtraction is the same as adding, only it's the inverse relationship. So they basically have the same rules. So in algebra, there's no subtraction, it's only addition. So there are addition subtraction rules, and there are different rules for multiplying, dividing, Okay. Dividing is the inverse operation of multiplication. So in algebra, there's no division, only multiplication. All right, so whenever you add or subtract, all you're paying attention to is the number of decimal places. And I'm gonna give you a metaphor. Whenever we do operations in a science, we want to always, the answer is always going to reflect the weakest link. Just like a chain. If you've got a chain, the chain can hold the strongest link. Excuse me. It's the opposite. The chain can only hold the weakest link because it'll break, 
So if all the links can hold 100 pounds, except one can hold 10 pounds, when you pick up 11 pounds, the 10 pound link is gonna break. So really it's, it's a 10 pound chain. Math, it's the same thing with significant figures. Okay, so if we're looking at decimal places, you've got one decimal place, two decimal places. So our answer is gonna have the less of that, which would be one. So then we round to that one place. So our answer is gonna be to start with that, but we have to round to one decimal place. So if it's zero to four, you drop it. If it's five to nine, you increase by one. Now in some schools, when you're rounding, if you have a five and it's an odd number, you do one thing, it's five of an even number, you do another thing. In our class, if it's five, you go up. Just simplify. Also, if you take a statistics class, they'll tell you the same thing. It, the five is dependent on whether it's an even or odd number. Okay, so remember now, this applies to addition and subtraction. Okay, so this has one decimal place, three decimal places. So our answer is going to have one decimal place. So you go to the second place, which is going to be the five. Doesn't matter what is after the five. Doesn't matter if it's nine, 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 nine. It doesn't matter. It's the only one that counts as the one after the one you're trying to round to. So we're trying to round to one. That's the, that's the eight. And how is that affected? Okay, it's five. So that means it goes up by one. So our answer is 4.9. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, now when you're multiplying, dividing, or doing exponentiation, it's different. Here we're looking at the whole number, sig fig wise, not decimal place. They have nothing to do with it. It's so you're gonna do it in your calculator, you're gonna punch this in your calculator and give you an answer. And then we need to look at the answer. So if I put that into my calculator, if you have not bought a calculator yet. Does everyone have a scientific calculator? Okay, if your calculator does not have an EE -E function on it, you should think about getting another one. They're fairly inexpensive. Um, I'd recommend a Texas 36. Um, this is an 84 and the EE -E is on here, but you gotta push a shift to get to it. Some of them have an EE exposed and it's real easy to use. Also, you can download a simulator on your phone to simulate different calculators as well. The calculator built into your phone is kind of a pain to use. Also, if you turn it landscape, it'll turn it into a scientific notation or a scientific calculator. Okay, so if I put in this here, The answer is going to be 5.11. Okay, the problem is that's not your answer. Your answer has to, we have to first determine the sig figs of each one of those numbers we're using to calculate. Okay, so 365 is three sig figs. 1.4 is two sig figs. So our answer is going to have two sig figs. So our calculator gives us three sig figs. So what we do, to, we go to the third place. It's zero to four, so we just drop it. So the answer is 5.1. Now, in this class, whenever I write an answer, I'll always say 2SF, two, two sig figs. 
You don't have to do that. I'm just doing it for clarity. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're dividing. So here I have division 1.5 times 10 to the fifth divided by 0 0.34. Mm. Now there's two ways to do this on your calculator. And I put in all the little steps. Put in 1.2 EE. Now what EE does is it glues the 1.2 and the 10.5 together. You don't have to put in times 10 carat five. It saves you three steps. Saving steps means there's less place for errors. If the divide key, when I have a fraction bar, that's the same as dividing, unless you're in an algebra class. Okay, so we have a fraction bar, that's the same as the division. So we're going 1.2 EE5 divide 0.34. Now, do you have to put the zero in, 0 0.34? If you're OCD, yes, you have to put it in. If you're not OCD, you don't have to. But the zeros in the beginning are optional. The zero on the left of the decimal point. Only the left of the decimal point is optional. So I put in 0 0.34. So this is what I really put in. All right, so this is what my calculator gave me. Okay, now let's analyze this. How many sig figs is 1.2 times 10 to the fifth? Two. Point 0.34. So our answer is gonna have how many? So we go to the third place. Doesn't matter what goes after it. There's a nine there, it doesn't really matter. Zero to, zero to four, we drop it, leaves us a 3.5 times 10 to the fifth. So you have to look at your problem. Now on your dry lab today, you're gonna have a, a page with addition subtraction on the left, of, of the page, you're gonna use the, the rules up here, where you're just looking at the decimal places. And then on the right column, you're gonna be multiplication division. So then you need to look at the whole number. Now for the rest of the semester, sig figs are gonna come into play. Your first lab, you're gonna talk about lab, first wet lab, lab three, you're gonna be talking about precision, measuring various objects, volume, length, et cetera. Okay, so um, it's officially time to go. Um, I want to cover one more thing because we had a late start before you start your lab. I'm going to talk about scientific notation. Um, some people are very uh, anal about this. 
a very hard and strict rules. The purpose of scientific notation is to make awkward numbers less awkward. Now, when we get into unit four, the end of unit three, we're going to be working with some really giant numbers. 23 zeros after it. A number called Avogadro's number. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. That's a giant number. Also, some numbers that are extremely small, like the mass of one electron. They're really tiny little guys. Hence, the mass is very, very small. So those numbers are very, very awkward. So the purpose of scientific notation is to make those giant numbers and those tiny, tiny numbers less awkward. And there's two parts to scientific notation. Proper scientific notation It's got the first number here is a number from one to 9.99999. It's gotta be greater than one, less than 10. The second number has to do with the decimal places we've used to convert that number to the 4.6. And if we're counting to the left, it's a negative exponent. If we're counting to the right, it's a positive exponent. So in this case, we counted 10 places from the four out to here. 10 places. So left is negative, right's positive. Okay, that's a pretty good size number. So for me, that's an awkward number. Now in this class, if in doubt, convert to scientific notation. Some of your teachers want you to convert everything to scientific notation, which to me is silly because the purpose of scientific notation is to make awkward things less awkward. If it's not awkward for you, leave it. Okay, so in dry lab one though, you're gonna be doing some exercises to get you used to converting. Okay, so in this case, we're gonna convert it to scientific notation. That means you have to start with a number from one to 10 or one to 9.99. Okay, so that's 4.234, ignoring the trailing zeros. Okay, so the zero is, here, and I want one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, when you go from here to here, you have to maintain precision. To maintain precision. How many sig figs is the top number? Four, trailing zeros, no decimal point, four sig figs. So that means the next number you create scientific notation has to be four sig figs as well. Four sig figs. So the precision of your number, we're just renaming it. We're not doing anything else, we're just renaming it. So your dry lab one is gonna practice that a fair amount going back and forth. Okay, that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, so uh, for those of you who have Friday Lab, um, I'm gonna have to take down this and I have to also convert the video over. So it'll be a few minutes. So what you, for those of you who have purchased your lab packet and have Friday Lab, just take it out, start working out. We're gonna be in lab, um, is it, was it 106 or was it 104? 106. Okay, which is the second, when you see the horse skeleton, 
It's the lab after that. And it'll be on your right. No, you have to buy it unless you want to um, share it with someone. 